Welcome everyone to Real Talk, Bias, Racism, and Decentering Whiteness in the Classroom. You showing up today demonstrate your willingness to grow, your willingness to learn, and the care you have for your students. We are here today to learn with and from one another because it is long overdue that we act. It's time to put action behind our words, to be intentional about change, because if we aren't, and if we don't, then we are complicit in the very same system that allows for our students to be pushed out of schools and into prisons, a system that benefits people of one skin color over another, and the same system that allows for an innocent man to be murdered on video at the hands of a police officer. What happened to George Floyd on May 25th, 2020 wasn't a unique occurrence. The outcry of response that has come from this, the momentum that it has gained, isn't because one horrible tragedy occurred. It's because these tragedies have occurred over and over again for far too long. All of us gathering here today is a step in the right direction, I hope. May we all be the agents of change and advocacy that the world needs. I want to begin today by affirming that Black Lives Matter. And we will now observe a moment of silence for George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony Robinson, and the countless other victims of racialized violence. As with any difficult conversation, it is important to set community guidelines, guidelines that must be upheld throughout the duration of our time together. Think of this as an experiential learning opportunity for yourself and for those who teach older students, be cognizant of the ways that you can infuse these practices from our conversations today into your classroom. During this event, throughout the difficult conversations that arise, we must practice empathy, focus on our own learning and be open to new ideas. The goal of conversations that revolve around race and sensitive yet critical topics such as these isn't that we all agree, but it's that we gain deeper understanding. That by practicing empathy, by being aware of and managing our emotions, by focusing on our own learning, we gain a deeper understanding. When you share out, as I hope you all do, please refrain from using we statements or generalizing an entire group of people. Stick with I statements and focus on your own personal experiences. For the duration of this event, whether during this main session or during the breakout small group discussions, feel free to use the Zoom emojis, which are accessible by clicking on the button on that appears on the bottom tab, which has reactions. And you'll see two, you'll see two hands clapping and a thumbs up. And what we'll ask you to do is We'll ask you to, so we actually thought there was a hand raise, but I guess that's been changed. Um, what we're gonna ask you to do is, if you hear something that was said that resonates with you, that you have a strong connection with, feel free to use the clapping emoji or response. And if you hear something that you'd like to respond to, maybe something that you feel challenged by, something you'd like to ask a question regarding, use the thumbs up. And the reason that you can do this is that the chat box is where you'll be adding your comments, where you'll be adding um, different questions that you have. And it's gonna be moderated by my wonderful colleague, Louisa, and she's gonna make sure that you're responded to. So by using those different Zoom reactions, we'll know to reach out to you. This is a highly interactive workshop and we wanna hear from you. Normally we record our workshops and we will not be recording the breakout sessions of this event because we want you to feel comfortable discussing. So this main section where you'll see me presenting is gonna be recorded so that people can view this as another time. But when we go into those small group discussions, those will not be recorded because we want you to feel comfortable discussing. And again, this isn't a lecture, this isn't a training, this isn't a course. Think of it as a structured forum with facilitators who care about each and every one of you. And we are all here to learn with and from one another. 
Now, you've certainly heard my voice a lot, and you may be wondering who I am, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Muna Algaithi, and I have the privilege of being the Education Engagement Specialist at PBS Wisconsin. My role here is planning and facilitating learning experiences for families and educators. I have been passionate about working with students and working in schools for the last seven years. And on the side, I also facilitate racial justice training and anti-Islamophobia trainings. And I have presented at the YWCA's Racial Justice Summit for the past two years. I'm mixed race, being the daughter of a Yemeni immigrant and of a white woman who converted to Islam, which has led to some interesting experiences of my own, navigating white spaces and experiencing otherness which is what propelled me into learning about race and social justice. Next, you'll hear from the two other facilitators that you'll be learning with today, Holly and Cindy. Holly, why don't you introduce yourself next? Okay, hello everyone. My name is Holly Tellender and um, I'm an elementary, I've actually taught all levels of education from kindergarten through university level. Um, I come to this work from a trauma-informed perspective. I began my teaching career in a Title I district in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, at that time just kind of established myself as a teacher whose main goal was the well-being of my students, Um, and that led me to learning a lot about how trauma impacts education and development and also how it impacts teaching. Um, I'm also an executive function function and academic coach. I own um, my own business. It's called Avant Academic Coaching and Consulting, where I work with teachers, families, and students. And above all else, I really uh, see myself as an educational activist. I think there are many things in the field of education that um, can be brought back into alignment to increase equity and um, just equity and a, a sense of well-being for all involved. And that's just a quote down there by Martin Luther King Jr. that I really inspires me. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Holly. And Cindy, can you introduce yourself? Of course. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm not sure why the slide didn't go. Hang on. So my name is, my name is, there we go. Thanks. That's easier. Um, My name is Cindy Milbrath. Um, I'm currently a teacher and advisor at the Prairie Phoenix Academy in Sun Prairie, which is the alternative school for at-risk students. Um, I have an issue with both of those terms, just so we're clear on that. Um, Basically, my beautiful students that I have had the honor of teaching there um, just didn't find themselves all too successful at the legacy schools. Um, I have been teaching for over a decade. I'm a high school teacher, um, mainly 11th and 12th grade. I have always taught alternative school. Um, I have taught in the bush of Alaska, in rural Alaska, in a Yupik Eskimo village. Um, I taught in a rural uh, charter school that was project-based in Minnesota. And then for the past seven, eight, set. I'm sorry, seven or eight years, I have been a teacher at the Prairie Phoenix Academy in Sun Prairie. I have a master's degree in earth and space science. I also have an alternative education degree, which allows me to teach all of the things. Um, I am a certified yoga instructor, which I also run workshops for in in my school currently. Um, I've been a presenter at the Innovative Schools Network a few times, uh, just talking about how we do school different um, and, oh, right, I'm non, uh, non-violent intervention trained and trauma-informed uh, caregiver as well. I feel super strongly about um, students and education and making education applicable for anyone, no matter how, where they're coming from, how they're coming to me, and just starting from where they're at. I'm super passionate about it. I love teaching, and people are my species, so it's really my honor, actually. (laughs) Thank you so much, both of you, for being with us today. Um, So what can you expect from a public media gal and two phenomenal teachers? After our opening, we're going to talk a little bit about what words can be used to describe racism and white supremacy. We'll watch a couple short videos from a New York Times docu-series about race. One is called White People Talking About Race, and the other is called Growing Up While Black. 
you'll then go into small groups to discuss the videos. After we come back to the large group, we'll talk a bit about what decentering whiteness in the classroom looks like, what it means to be an anti-racist. And then again, we will head back to the small groups to come up with strategies together to interviews into our classrooms. Before you know it, our time will be over. And I want you to know that after our webinar, you will receive an email within a week with a certificate of attendance and a list of resources to continue this learning. And again, I wanna remind you that this isn't a lecture, this isn't a training, this isn't a course. It's a, it's a structured form. We wanna hear from you, we wanna learn with you. Um, and so we'll just practice care about for each one and one another and um, we're all here to learn with and from one another. So speaking of that care and compassion, I'm gonna pass the mic to Holly. Okay, everybody. So <clears throat> I thought it would be a nice thing for us to just begin with a brief exercise to ground ourselves and settle our nervous systems. From a trauma-informed perspective, something that is universal no matter what our race is that we all are impacted by trauma and that we all have the ability to toggle between our parasympathetic and our sympathetic nervous system with a couple of very basic tools. And that first one is breath. And so if you could just take a moment with me to bring your feet flat to the floor and maybe feel all 10 toes on the ground beneath you. Just notice the feeling that that brings to your body. And then draw your navel in towards your spine a little bit and notice how that maybe elongates your torso. And then feel your, your elbows hanging heavy under your shoulders, drawing your shoulders away from your ears and just bringing a nice um, awake and aware quality to your whole being. And then allow yourself to settle into this present moment. Noticing your breath just as it is. Noticing any feelings that are arising and just allowing them to pass. If it feels comfortable, you can bring your palm to your chest, maybe tap lightly a couple of times there. That can be very soothing to the nervous system. And then let's all take three collective breaths together, allowing our belly to expand on the inhale. And then allowing the exhale to just arise naturally. And then another inhale. Allowing the exhale to leave fully. And then one last inhale together. Really feeling the belly. And then allowing yourself to soften as you exhale. Just take a moment here to release any muscle tension or just even become aware of any muscle tension. It may be difficult to release it, but awareness is the first step. And just take a moment to give yourself some grace, some acceptance where you are right now and the feeling of gratitude for the opportunity here for us all to learn together. And then you can just release your hands and settle back. Thank you, Holly. At PBS Wisconsin, we addressed in our recent statement to the communities that we serve, we are not afraid of difficult issues nor to stand against racism and intolerance. We offer content that provides hope and challenges perspectives. Furthermore, we will continue to offer new perspectives to connect communities, promote civic and civil dialogue and explore our most challenging issues. And that's what brings us here today. Mr. Rogers, a public media fan favorite, once said, there is no normal life that is free of pain. It's the very wrestling with our problems that can be the impetus for our growth. 
Racialized injustice is a problem that affects us all, with many being impacted, and as we were reminded on May 25th, killed at disproportionate rates. I hope that the conversations we engage in today are the impetus for your growth. So let's talk about race. It's important to understand the, cons the construct of race and racism. Race is, in and of itself is a relatively new construct created in around the 1800s by Europeans to legitimize the dominance of one group, white people, over non-white people. Race has no real or accu accurate biological basis. It's a political construction. However, today, the social construct of race and the attributions to specific races can be a matter of life or death. While race doesn't have a scientific basis, it speaks to social realities. And our role, especially those of us who are non-Black or who are non-POC, our role is to listen and use our privilege or a set of unearned advantages to advocate for justice. When it comes to racism, we hear this word often and we often associate it with an interpersonal act. So saying something offensive to a POC, drawing an inappropriate image, not letting your, your kids play with other children of color, but it's a lot deeper than that. Racist acts can certainly be personal, but it's integral to understand that racism is institutional. It's systemic and it's upheld by the system of white supremacy, which is another term that you may have heard of. On the right side in this rectangle, you'll see how the system of white supremacy racism operates to include, serve, uplift, and validate whiteness while excluding and oppressing people of color. The term white supremacy might make you think of KKK or public lynchings, but I encourage you to think of white supremacy as a system that benefits whiteness. As David Gilborn, author of Rethinking White Supremacy said, white supremacy is a comprehensive condition whereby the interests and perceptions of white subjects are continually placed center stage and assumed as normal. When I read that, I found that to be very interesting because when we hear white supremacy, we think of the most radical acts, but nowhere in this definition does the author say that. He's talking about it as assuming the norm, the presumption of the normative. So let's hear from activist really quickly, DeRay McKenson to help us understand the proximity or the role of whiteness in white supremacy. What's the difference between whiteness and white supremacy? Now, white supremacy is a system that says that white people are the, are the norm, are normative, are worth more, and are valued at the expense of others. And we think about a culture that that idea spawns, that is whiteness. And then we think like, about white people as people who benefit from uh, the system of white supremacy, whether they participate in it actively or not. And part of this work is about helping people understand that uh, allies and accomplices are people who like understand the work, they understand that there's like an issue, uh, and understanding white privilege says that I get that I participate in a dominant culture and I benefit from a system of white supremacy whether I've done something supremacist or not. And that is like a personal recognition. Uh, we want people to take that personal recognition a, a step further and say like, what are the systemic things that actually create this privilege in the first place? And we want them to fight at that level. That's what accomplices do. But I wanted to, you know, I tweet a lot this phrase, watch whiteness work. So if you were to just summarize in like a sentence, what is your message to the white community and white people? White people got to organize themselves, uh, have to join solidarity work with people of color, uh, and have to use personal experiences to think about how systems allow privilege to manifest at the personal level. So again, racism is much more than a biased thought or action against a person from a different group. It's racial prejudice plus social and institutional power. It's a system of advantage based on race. It's a system of oppression based on race. And it's all ingrained into a white supremacy system. This is why things like reverse racism don't exist because a black or a Latinx person cannot be racist against a white person. Because even if the POC does or says something prejudiced against a member of another race, there isn't that added social or institutional power. And just on one note, when it comes to defining race, I really wanted to share this quote by scholar and author, Dr. Robin D'Angelo, who's well known for her book called White Fragility. 
Dr. D'Angelo said social scientists define racism as a multidimensional, highly adaptive system, a system that ensures an unequal distribution of resources among racial groups. The group that controls the institutions controls the distribution and embeds its racial bias into the fabric of society. In the U.S., while individual whites might be against racism, they still benefit from their group's control. Yes, an individual person of color can sit at the tables of power, but the overwhelming majority of decision makers will still be white. Yes, white people can have problems and face barriers, but systematic racism won't be one of them. <clears throat> Now, let's hear stories from individuals on opposite sides of the racial binary by watching the following videos, Growing Up Black and White People Talking About Race. Both of them are short videos that you are going to have the opportunity to talk about when we go into small group discussions after this. As we watch this video, I encourage you to think to yourself, are you able to relate to any of these experiences shared? Do, you, do any of the experiences you hear come as a surprise? Racism means basically like... A large part of a, a race feels that they're superior to another race. And so, and so not only do they believe that, but they act on it. Examples would be in class, sometimes I'd be the only black kid. And we read a book like, I don't know, Huck Finn. And then there's that uncomfortable moment. The, the magic word <laughs> come up and people would look at you and you're like, what's his reaction and things like that. I was walking home from school with this one white girl and we just gone off the bus and we were about to, we were almost home and there were these group of black kids that just gone out of school. And she was like, oh, let's cross the street. There's a group of black kids. I don't want to run into them. And so she told me, which I don't even know why she would do that. I used to wear a sweatband like just to reinforce my wrist and I had a teacher come up to me and say you should take it off because it looks gang affiliated. I've been in situations where you know I had to cross the street because I didn't want to scare the white lady that was walking. I would actually, it would get to the point where I would start to count how many times a woman would clutch her bag. When I was 16, I was leaving my mom's house in my pajamas, which had snowmen on them, um, with my brother, and we were actually stopped by the police rather aggressively. I've been stopped by the cops on my way between classes, because we have two separate buildings, walking from one building to the other building, as my white students in the same class walk by me. It's kind of upsetting, because we live in a world where my mom has to be afraid when I walk outside from the people that are like meant to protect me. And I just, I don't like when my mother feels like that. You know, I love my mother. She should always, I want her to always be happy. You know, I walk tall, I keep my head up, very, you know, try to be very articulate and, and polite. Um, and so, I, of course, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be fine because I act a certain way. And of course, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, people, the way people perceive you, you know, it is not up to you. My parents taught me, oh, you know, cops are your friends, you're supposed to, you know, they're here to protect you, but all I'm seeing is the opposite. So how can I not be afraid when I feel like I'm being hunted? When I feel like I'm there to fill a quota? We are in a so-called free society, and as a black man, we literally don't feel free. Um, we don't know what freedom is. Every time we're, we're killed, the first thing you see on the news is, oh, criminal record or something like that. So from the, from the second the bullet hits us, already we're starting to be dehumanized. With black people like myself, we don't get as many chances as, as, as they do. So you have to be aware and you have to watch out and you can't mess up. This was an extremely emotionally taxing process for me in terms of coming to terms with maybe the, the nature of, of racism in my own life and in this country and in this world. And if you wait until somebody is 12, 13, and 14 to put that on them, it's, it's really, it can be really difficult. My dad, he's just like the honest one. He's like, listen, son, like there are things in this world like you have to, you kind of have to watch out. He doesn't want me to live in fear, but he wants me to be aware. I want people to know that I'm perfectly fine and I'm not going to hurt anybody or do anything bad.
And I should be judged about like who I who I am and like and what kind of person I am. My parents would tell me, especially my mom, she would tell me, you have to endure, you have to muscle through it. And like, and this is no different. You, it's a part of being a person of color in America. And there's a certain comfortability associated with that because if I know that something is inevitable, then I know how to deal with it. I, fortunately, I've had parents who have said, this is what you do. Mom and dad, I'll be fine because you did a good job raising me. Uh, you gave me all the resources and the time and the blood, sweat, and tears um, to make me a good man, an honorable man, and the foundation to survive in this country. I want you to know that I will act in an appropriate manner and do everything that you told me to do because I do love you, and I know that everything you say is not for a reason and not just to talk to talk, and I love you. As we watch this next video, I want you to think about the differences from the video that we just watched and also pay attention to anything that said that you might be able to resonate with. It's very uncomfortable to talk about race. Um, it's not something. It's not something I do. I am. I am feeling a, apprehensive um, because I think there's a lot of reasons why I feel like I should be able to talk about race. Uh, I don't want to say anything. Uh, you know, that would offend anyone. It's a very touchy subject. It's still difficult, even if you feel like you're on the right side of it, to, you know, to have a dialogue about it. Especially for white people, because we don't want to see if the racism that we may be holding on to. I don't know. Maybe I am racist. I, I certainly don't like to think that I am. And, and I think that's, too, because the perception in this society, perception of a racist is, is a guy in a robe. Now I understand that it's a system of advantages and disadvantages based on race. So as much as there's the disadvantage piece of it, there's the advantage piece of it, which is what I experience as a white person. I want to bring up race, and I want to bring it up in a frame that helps my children think that there's no difference. But the mere fact that I might be bringing it up could suggest that there is a difference. I remember asking a friend of my father's who who's black, why he was called black because his skin was brown. And I've learned that lots of people that are white ask this question, and maybe they also received the answer that I got from my parents, which was like, oh my gosh, we're so sorry that she asked that, and it's just a term, like, move on. One of my third grade students um, seemed pretty rocked um, after the Eric Garner case, or death, and um, came up to me and said, you know, why, when you were little, like, were you worried about this stuff too? And I knew what he was talking about before. I mean, I didn't say, what do you mean, what stuff? I didn't want to, you know, play dumb. Um, and I said, you know, no, like, I didn't have to be. Um, and that's not fair. And that was really hard because he just kind of sat there. And it, it honestly seemed like the first time that he had considered the fact that not everyone um, had to think about race all the time. I know that I'm white, and I guess I'm part of that collection. Um, uh, but uh, I don't think about being white. I don't. I really did not know that I had a racial identity. I knew I was white. I, did, I, I had no idea what that meant, how that had shaped my outlook on life, how that had shaped my uh, sense of optimism, sense of belonging sense of safety, sense of feeling entitled to go help children that I thought 
were part of, a part of a community that couldn't figure out how to help themselves. I think that impulse, that kind of colorblindness impulse, comes mostly from white people. Like I've never heard, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure it comes from all people of all kinds, but I've heard it most from white people who are saying like, let's do this as a way of getting past this racism thing. And I think in part it comes from um, a sense of shame and guilt about what racism has done and and kind of how racism was built by white by white people. I don't want to be ashamed of being, a, and plus I'm a male. It's like every group out there can be pissed off at me because I'm white and a male. And that's a weird kind of burden that some people do feel. And I certainly feel it sometimes from people that I'm privileged. I get stuff that other people don't get. I think we're all implicated in a racist system, and I play my part in it as a white person. So I do have individual responsibility and accountability. I mean, I'm part of the system, and I do things that both perpetuate it, and I try to certainly do things that challenge it. I realize I've never said anything. When I've, when I've heard racist jokes, when I've heard racist comments, I've never said anything. I've never spoken up and said, hey, <laughs> that's racist, <laughs> not once. In my mind, there's, there's no, I'm not involved in any conflict that involves race. I've only been the beneficiary of it. So um, to talk about it is, is I don't think I, I would sound very wise. Being white means that I have the privilege to think that I'm not affected by racism. Uh, or that I don't even have a race, because I have all these other things, like a gender and a sexual orientation, and those are pretty neat, so I don't have a race. Uh, but, but I do, and I'm white. All right, I hope you're ready to share in your small group discussions. Welcome back everyone. Thank you so much for engaging in these conversations. We are going to move into the second part of the event um, of this discussion where we're talking about decentering whiteness in the classroom. Um, Holly and Cindy, as educators, I'm curious, what are your first thoughts when you hear that phrase, decentering whiteness in the classroom? Fair, it'll probably help if I'm unmuted. Um, so for me, the the phrase decentering whiteness is one that I've been reflecting on for a while. I'm trying to better understand it. And what I've come the where what I'm kind of sitting with lately is um, to build, continue to build an awareness of my Eurocentric biases. Uh, so some examples of Eurocentric biases that I have found in, within myself are that uh, compliance equals respect, right? I have this idea that if somebody's complying with what I've asked them to do, that means they respect me and they respect what I'm doing. Um, competition is motivating. That's another um, sort of a Eurocentric biases, bias that I have um, found within myself. Um, that individualism is the gold standard, right? That, that everybody's out, really should be out for themselves. Um, and a sense of urgency, and and um, and that's a new one to me. Muna shared that one with me, and, it, and I can totally see that um, a sense of urgency as a, a Eurocentric ideal. It's also something that we are really kind of pressed into as teachers, right? It, every minute must count. Every we must, if we're doing something, it must be uh, measurable, and and that sort of thing, and kind of that over reliance on output rather than co um, connection. Um, also, I've really been challenging myself to just completely stop using the word normal in any context, because that's a very Eurocentric thing to say, um, you know, this idea that, that there's a, a, anything normal. Um, and, um, and also, you know, in, this is, um, this is a Eurocentric bias that I, that I have uncovered, but it's also a teacher problem, I think, which is. Uh, my temptation to come across as the expert in the room whenever I'm in the room, right? And and my my like discomfort, any discomfort I may feel, although I am getting better about it, at saying I don't know or what do you think, and modeling myself uh, in the space as a facilitator rather than an, an instructor. So decentering whiteness to me is just to 
is just like, um, you know, becoming aware of those biases. And then um, like a, earlier when we did the mindfulness exercise, sometimes I'll even pat myself on the chest, which is kind of a, a nervous system soothing thing when I recognize, oh my gosh, I, I have this thing and I don't like it. I don't want to have that. And I don't know how to get rid of it. And this can help me. But that's what it means just to be aware and to, and to be on the lookout always for those. Thank you for sharing that. Cindy, did you want to share what comes to mind when you hear decentering whiteness, what that might look like? Sure. Um, mine becomes much more of like an a action compared to uh, Polly. I mean, obviously, I think about it a lot too. So I'm thinking more like, actually, Mona, I think you said it the other day, like, how do you combat it in the classroom? And when I think of that, I'm like, yep, how do we put the boots on the ground to decenter whiteness in the classroom? Um, so when I think about how work in my little school is we, I try to spend a bunch of time on both teaching and unlearning biases. So having really hard conversations, asking tough questions, but it's, that's difficult to do unless you don't have community. My school is small enough that we work really super hard um, in like the you know pedagogical term of holistic education. My, my students call me Cindy. They know my last name, but most of them forget it. Like we come at each other from a whole person to a whole person, we check in each and every day. I can look at my some of my students' faces and know what's what's going on. You're not good, you're not healthy, like what's what's happening with that. So doing that teaching and learning on biases and asking those hard questions. What that also means is having the hard conversations, which doesn't feel comfortable as a white lady, I'll tell you, like I and I'll cry every time I I have to do it. And right, I cry easy anyway, but crying in front of my students, letting them know like, hey, look, I'm sorry. If three of my students of color are hanging out together on the street corner and two of you have the same sweater on, someone's going to have to go home and change. And I hate to have to teach you that, but it's also my job to protect you. If you get pulled over, do you know what to say? Do you know what your rights are? And actually teaching those in a real applicable level. That sucks but it actually is reality and decentering that whiteness is me having those uncomfortable conversations with like looking at my students and being like oh this is probably going to happen to you how can I best protect you in this situation and how can we understand each other and and move together to make those sort of changes and the last thing I'll talk about is I um, attended a speech um, by Killer Mike, who is a rapper from Run the Jewels, who's maybe one of my favorites. But um, one really amazing thing that he said that stuck with me all the time is go to a park where no one looks like you. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you visited a park? No matter what skin you live in, when was the last time you went to a park where no one else looks at you and you visited with the people in that park? Because that's where learning happens, because that's uncomfortable but they're still your species. And there is, that is where growth and change happens. Um, I think the only other thing about decentering that I would talk about is like also remembering that youth culture is a thing. And in my breakout session, we talked about that a little bit, but um, Shiraki Holly talks about it a lot. He's a really amazing speaker and educator if people are interested. Uh, but he talks about youth culture. Is that hat really bothering you? Is it really impending the thing or is it just because you're not in control? So are you prepared or are you in control? And that understanding those kinds of things to me helped me figure out how to dissenter whiteness in my own classroom and in my own in my own body. Thank you both for sharing from your own experiences. And I think that your experiences lend really well to what I have listed here for ideas for decentering whiteness in the classroom. Um, and it starts with investigating what it means to be white, what it means to be white and what is your relationship with systems of power. So Zeus, Zeus Leonardo, who's an author of a book called Race, Whiteness and Education, he says that whiteness is a discourse of power, but white people aren't whiteness. White people have a relationship to whiteness, therefore a relationship to systems of power and are faced with a choice. How can that relationship be transformed 
to enact pedagogy that is anti-racist or doesn't perpetuate systems of oppression. Another tip is to pay attention to the role of whiteness in your classrooms. This came up a lot during our breakout room. You are a classroom leader. If you think a student is challenging or if you send a student to the principal's office or if you grade one student more harshly than one another, these are ways that perpetuate, that perpetuate racial oppression if they are occurring disproportionately against students of color. And the sad thing is that studies show that this is true that it's imperative to recognize your implicit biases because whether you're aware of it or not, they come into life in your classroom. I recommend looking into a study done by a Harvard professor in the 1960s where he tested teacher bias. Um, and the study that he did is the basis for most of the following research on stereotypes in the classroom. And one of the things that was describing the study talked about how the principle is the same, whether it's gender or race, student preference or handwriting, any factor that causes a teacher to have higher expectations for some of their students and lower expectations for others is bound to create results to match. A 2014 report showed that teachers increased the severity of suggested disciplinary actions when the race of the teachers didn't match that of the child. So it's critical to pay attention to the way that whiteness shows up in the classroom. Center the experiences of your students, and this can be done regardless of race. White systems of education are deemed as official knowledge, historically accurate, reliable. But what would it look like to infuse ethnic studies, oral traditions into your classrooms? Students and families of color are the experts in their own experiences and in their own learning. And the more we can do to remove ourselves from the center of that, the more we can center students in their own learning. For learning more about how to do this, I really recommend looking into the book For White People Who Teach in the Hood by Christopher Emden. It applies to all teachers regardless of where you work. Another essential thing to do for decentering whiteness in the classroom is understanding microaggressions. In order to understand microaggressions, you have to understand the implicit bias that you hold. There are multiple tests that you can do online, which are called bias inventories, and they help you understand bias that you may not have even been aware of. Have you ever asked one student to speak for their entire racial or ethnic group? Have you not taken the time to pronounce their name correctly? Do you acknowledge a student's religion that might not be mainstream as much as you would Christmas? I really struggled with my experiences in schools in the United States, which was in three different states, because my culture and way of life was never represented. And it was racialized and demonized for other political reasons. Um, but my teachers never knew about the holidays that I, that I celebrated and wished me happy holidays. Um, but we always got two weeks off for Christmas. And, and so thinking about how those can translate into microaggressions in the classroom, and if and when we commit them, it's so important to apologize and hold yourself accountable moving forward. Lastly, be a lifelong learner. Read books, listen to podcasts, center the experiences and knowledge of people out of your own race and ethnicity. Learn from other teachers who are doing the work. Think of the ways that you can infuse the strategies that they use into your own classroom. And we're going to have time to talk, um, to go back into our, our small breakout rooms to see what are some strategies that other teachers have used? Um, or what are some things that we might be able to try in our classrooms? So next, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you some reflection questions. And these questions come from a presentation by Dr. Gretchen Rudham, who's an assistant professor of a college in Baltimore. And her presentation is titled, How White is My Classroom? And the questions that she offered are based out of her own research um, as a guide for other white teachers. So here are some of those questions. What deep restructuring do I need to do to my vision of the potential of my students? Am I willing to acknowledge that my style of teaching may need to change? How does my pedagogy prove that I believe in the inherent genius of all of my students? Does my classroom set up a space that promotes safety for students of color? Are both course content and discussions safe for students of color? And just so you all know too, this presentation will be emailed out to you. So you will have these questions to be able to sit with and reflect on after our event. Do I include those considered marginal without a willingness to accord their work the same respect and consideration given to other work? Do I move past 
tokenism in presentations, authors, content. What risks am I willing to take in my practice? Do I reward risk taking as a part of my classroom? Does my class content connect to everyday lived experiences of all of my students? Do I invite critical self-reflection that transforms their lives? How does, my how does my classroom set up students to use their own authority of experience and share their experiential knowledge? Do I use classroom pedagogical strategies that affirm their presence, their right to speak in multiple ways on diverse topics? And lastly, does your classroom provide the time, space, or support for students to process experiences and emotions that come with coping with everyday racism and discrimination? Ibrahim Kendi, author of Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, says, the heartbeat of racism is denial, and therefore the heartbeat of anti-racism is acknowledgement. Take a look, take a moment to look at this graphic and just think, where do you stand? And where do you want to be? And how will you get there? We'll get a chance to look at this graphic again in our small group discussions. It can be overwhelming to start, to think about ways to infuse these practices into your classrooms. And I like to look at this graphic as a way to know that in order to achieve social change, right, which can be summarized as equity, inclusion, liberation, justice, resiliency, interdependency, there are so many different roles that it takes to get there and you don't have to be all of them. But as educators, you easily fit into multiple of these roles. And so which one of these lend themselves already to the work that you can see yourself doing? We'll discuss these also in our breakout rooms. We'll come back here after our small group discussion. So we'll only have about 13 minutes in our small group discussions and then we'll come back here um, and just I really want you all to know that this is just the beginning of these conversations um, we will have more opportunities to keep this conversation going um, all right everyone welcome back I recognize that we have about a minute um, before it is time oh just kidding it's time now um, as a facilitator it is one of the hardest thing for me to do is stop um, incredible conversations, meaningful conversations, but just know that this is the first of work that we are going to be doing um, continuously. So just make sure that you are subscribed to our newsletter, that you're paying attention to what we're putting out there um, because this conversation doesn't end today. Um, I don't have enough time to go through all of the resources that I had prepared for you, but just know that in the follow-up email, um, you will have a link to this presentation. So you'll get to see, um, the pretty slides of presentations that I thought would be beneficial. And um, you will also um, get to, I'll also send out different links to different resources that are beneficial. Um, and I just wanted to share two quotes that were powerful um, in my opinion. So this one was from a middle school teacher in Detroit. And he says, to start the conversations, teachers should ask their students from kindergarten on up two basic questions. Is this fair and how does this make you feel? Um, and I just wanted to close out again with Mr. Rogers. Uh, we live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say, it's not my child, not my community, not my world, not my problem. Then there are those who see the need and respond. And I consider those people my heroes. Um, so thank you all for being heroes and showing up today to have these courageous conversations. And I thank you all. Thank you.